Hi, this is Cal Ripken Jr., and you're listening to the ML Sports Platter. And the ML Sports Platter back with you all over the major platforms. Please download, subscribe, leave feedback, and a five-star review where you get podcasts on your smartphone device. We are brought to you by the Allen Angus Pub, Sit Means Sit Syracuse, Axe Exotic Pets, and Brian Conboy of Mass Mutual New York State. Tax-efficient retirement planning today with Brian Conboy. Make sure you go with Brian. Get your financial future set up. You might have a youngster heading out to college very soon. You might be changing careers. You might be on the doorstep of retirement So get on over to advisors.massmutual.com. That's advisors.massmutual.com. And, of course, you can get Brian Conboy on Facebook and on LinkedIn as well. Brian Conboy of Mass Mutual New York State is a proud ML Sports Platter supporter. Well, today is the big day. Derek Jeter, Larry Walker, Ted Simmons, Marvin Miller posthumously going into the Baseball Hall of Fame. It is induction day, and I can't wait for it. Uh, I'm down in Cooperstown uh, as we speak, and um, it's going to be just a really special day. Obviously, 2020 was canceled due to the coronavirus, and uh, 2021 here, no induction class for 2021, and so they're going to do the ceremony uh, today, Wednesday, uh, the 8th, and uh, of course, that will be for the class of 2020. Did a nice job back in July and in other moments of celebrating both media classes, of course, 2020 and 2021, the Writers Awards and the Broadcast Awards, but it's going to be a very special day today, uh, and of course, uh, you can catch it on MLB Network all afternoon long, starting at 1.30. The Clark Sports Center will be draped with fans. I know it's a Wednesday. I know it's a little after Labor Day. Uh, I know it's right when school starts and all that sort of thing, but I still think people will make, uh, they'll shove things to the side, let's put it that way, to make sure that they are there. And who better to talk to? about this induction class and a celebration of Derek Jeter, which this podcast is. I'm going to do a segment uh, just after this on Jeter, what he's meant to me, what he's meant to the game, his impact, why he's underrated, and a heck of a lot more. And then I'll play you some audio from a Zoom call that I was on with Derek Jeter last week. But who better to talk to than the president of the Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum, Jeff Idelson. Of course, you remember Jeff being a president uh, for the Hall of Fame Uh, Leaving when Tim Mead got uh, hired, Tim Mead resigns. Jeff Idelson is back in the chair uh, until the induction, and uh, he's just done an amazing job, not only as president of the Hall of Fame, but his career in baseball before that. And, of course, let us not forget his great work right now promoting the game through Grassroots Baseball. Go follow Grassroots Baseball all over social media platforms. Jeff, thank you for a few minutes. I'm so excited for today. It means a lot that you always come on. How are you? I'm doing great, Michael. Always good to be with you. Well, I can't wait for this induction. First of all, you know, from me and baseball fans and media folks everywhere, just thank you to you and, you know, the staff and everybody down there for making this work to honor the 2020 class. It's going to be a great day. And uh, just, you know, kind of a tip of the cap to all of you for, for, for making this thing happen. Well, thanks, Michael. It's not easy. As, I, as I've as i often said the last couple of weeks, it's just like trying to navigate a ship through the Bermuda Triangle. You just don't know what's coming at you next. But we feel that we are in really, really good shape in terms of doing this well, in terms of doing this safely, and uh, in terms of providing a great fan experience as long as uh, Mother Nature can hang with us. Yeah, no doubt about it. Obviously, the class is super special. Headlined by Derek Jeter. We'll get to him last. But uh, hit on a little bit for me in, in terms of the impact where you see. I mean, Marvin Miller's is, is pretty obvious, but uh, you know the the longtime union leader heads in along with Larry Walker and Ted Simmons. That trio, their impact on the game one by one from from your seat. Uh, what, what how you feel they've they've really made a mark. And, and Marvin Miller, we know again, it's the obvious one, but it, it it went beyond that a little bit too. I think. Yeah, I mean Marvin. I mean he really came in after working with U.S. Steel and representing the steel workers. Not working with U.S. Steel, but the steel workers. They had the union back in 1966. Negotiated the first collective bargaining agreement between owners and players, and really established a framework that allowed uh, uh, players to be paid at the rate that they should be. And uh, you know he secured the right to independent arbitration to resolve player grievances, and uh, that's when free agency came about. And those are the hallmarks of Marvin Miller's career in terms of, uh, of getting the game and making a much bigger business. 
Ted Simmons fits it perfectly with Marvin because he was a big union guy and, and a union rep for many years. But beyond that, 21 seasons of baseball with the Cardinals, Brewers, and Braves, he could hit. He could hit for uh, power and average, 2,500 hits lifetime, 500 doubles, 250 home runs, never struck out, really low strikeout guy, put the ball in play, a little different from the game today. An eight-time All-Star, uh, he was top 10 in batting average six times. And when you just think of him, uh, you think of him as one of the most successful uh, most successful uh, switch hitting catchers of all time and uh, durable he ranked eighth in games caught when he retired and first in home runs among national league switch hitters at the time of his retirement mm. then you move to larry walker big power hitter who also could hit for average like ted simmons three national league batting titles he was an mvp in 1997 he's one of four retired players with a uh, that could run and hit and hit for power 300 batting average, 300 home runs, 200 stolen bases. The only other three besides him are Hank Aaron, George Brett, and Willie Mays. <laughs> Pretty solid. Um, Derek Jeter, obviously his career 20 years in one uniform with the Yankees, and, and it goes on and on and on. I mean, six all-time in hits, the five rings, the clutchness, the flip play, Mr. November and all that. But when do you think, Jeff, Derek Jeter you know, officially arrived as a beloved baseball figure? It was built pretty quickly, uh, Michael. You know, uh, uh, having been there when we drafted Derek, uh, working for the Yankees back in 1992, and uh, you know him, him, him coming out of Kalamazoo High School, you could tell right away that he had poise, that he was, uh, he had, he definitely was had a, a strong upbringing and strong parenting, and that served him well, and especially like a place in New York, and you know, New York is whether you like the Yankees or not, the Yankees are are the penultimate team with all the championships, and Derek rises to the top of all those great players. He played more games than Mantle, Derek, Barra, and Ruth. Uh, he stepped into the, into the scene in 1996 as Rookie of the Year, won a World Series. He finished sixth all-time in hits, 3,400-plus, eight 200-hit seasons, five World Series titles, 14-time All-Star. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And uh, There's no one who represents the, the Yankee heritage and lineage better than Derek, and uh, there's a reason they have a name to captain since he retired there. No doubt. President of the Hall of Fame down there in Cooperstown, Jeff Idelson, our guest on the ML Sports Platter. What has your relationship been like with Derek through the years? Uh, very cordial. I mean, obviously I wasn't working for the Yankees, so my inter- interactions weren't, with him weren't uh, often, but every time we got together, um, just to, to always had great interactions, always wanted to take care of the Hall of Fame whenever I asked for an artifact, starting with his jersey from the 1996 World Series. He never said no, and just a guy that always seems to get it right, Mike. I have uh, I have two children that are now grown up. They're 25 and 21, but uh, so my daughter declared herself a giant uh, Derek Jeter fan when she was 11, which was the year he was going for 3,000 hits mm-hmm. so i go down to talk to derek at spring training and i tell him about my uh, we talk about what he's going to donate to the hall of fame you know later that season and he says how's your family i said well my daughter nicole loves you and he says oh is she a yankees fan i said she is i said but i have a, a little bit of an issue because her older brother aaron uh is a diehard red sox fan uh you know so uh, so nicky's the yankee fan and he looked me right in the eye and he said jeff everybody knows the girls are smarter than boys <laughs> <clears throat> he always played it cool like that, you know, and, and it's funny because a lot of people get on him for, well, he wasn't a great quote, and I'm going, man, you know, I actually think the way he kept cool, calm, and collected in the way he spoke and how well he spoke through his career and now, and, and I just watched the Jack Curry interview on the Yes Network, The Road to Cooperstown, and his answers were fantastic. His quotes are really, really good. The problem is people didn't get something that was super controversial or super negative, and so therefore they frowned upon him. But I think Jeter's actually been a great quote through the years, and I think he's pretty funny. Well, yeah, I mean, being a great quote doesn't really mean much of anything if, uh, I guess it relates to really anything. And I think sometimes fans get caught up too much in, in what a guy says or not. I mean, it can only be one yogi. He was a great quote. <laughs> I'll take Derek and uh, all the championships he brought to New York. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. A couple more for you, Jeff. I know you're you're flying around here. Um as far as putting this thing together, um, when when did it come to a realization that you'd be able to do it? You know, I know there were some dates that were set and different ticket circumstances, and you know, mass versus no mass and vaccination and all that sort of thing. When did when did it kind of when did you get to the spot where you said, okay, I think we can pull this off. Here's what we're doing, and here's the date. Well, we seemed we seemed to turn a corner as a nation, you know only to turn another corner, but we seemed to turn a quarter in, corner in June, and it looked, things were looking 
This was before the Delta variant was around here. It was in Europe, and things were looking really rosy. And that, that's when we made the decision, okay, let's see what we can do. Let's see um, if we can make this be outside. You know, induction is about the inductees. It's about the fans. It's about the Hall of Famers who want to come back. So how do we move this from an outdoor ceremony, an indoor ceremony to an outdoor, outdoor ceremony, keeping in mind that those are the most important things, this is the induction ceremony, the Hall of Famers, and the fans. And so we were able to put it together in June. It's, 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 it's a big ship to move. There's a lot of moving parts. Uh, and we had three dates that could work for the Otisaga Resort Hotel, which is our headquarters hotel. Mm-hmm. Uh, because of COVID, weddings have been backlogged forever. And now they're doing two, three, or four on every weekend. So basically came down to three dates in September 8th, though not ideal, uh, being on a Wednesday after school's back in session. Uh, it just uh, it ended up being the one date that could work where all the pieces fit. So that's how we landed on September 8th. I'm just thrilled we can have this outside. 34 Hall of Famers in Cooperstown and all the fans who are able to uh, come to induction, they'll have that opportunity. Final one for you. Um, you know, Jeter, to me, he's my DiMaggio. You know, he's my Mickey Mantle. He's my generation's guy, the face, face of my favorite team, favorite player of all time. Who, who do you think he's most comparable to as a generational face of the game or, or just a generational figure in general in baseball history? Is he is he more comparable to a Mantle or a DiMaggio? Is it Musial? Is it Mays? Is it is it a Ruth? I mean, we, you have to kind of compare him to those kind of guys because he has been like that for for people my age and and a little bit younger, Jeff, and and even for you. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, he's certainly uh, one of these guys that he, usually the, t- the the telltale is, is is how you do induction weekend, how many fans come, because that's when you realize the. The, the, the depth or the where where the guy is revered and there are a few guys that transcend the game because they're accessible because they uh, let the fans get as close to them as they can within re- you know within within reason and it's guys like him I think I think of Cal Ripken I think of Ken Griffey Jr. Uh, I think of a, of a you know I think of a guy like a Ted Williams mm-hmm. um, there are guys that are just revered and uh, you know Mickey Mantle's in that in that boat as well so. Um, you know, it's hard to pick anyone at one point, but I, I think you know Griffey, Ripken of more of vintage, or more recent vintage, and then you know guys like perhaps like we said, like Mantle going back to the fifties. So the second Wednesday is over with this induction. Is it like do you remove the interim tag and the and the former president tag? Do you do it? All, do you have both tags together and back to grassroots? <laughs> <laughs> Great question, Michael. No, we have a great new president who's uh, taking over at the Hall of Fame. His name is Josh Rowlich. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he, he had a dozen years in the Dodger organization working for the O'Malley's and then uh, uh, subsequent ownerships, another 15 in Arizona with the Diamondbacks. And sure. he's been here a few weeks. We've been running parallel together. And uh, this, is a, this is a guy that's going to take the institution to new heights. I have a lot of respect for Josh. So we'll get through Wednesday's induction and then all sort of uh, fade like a Christy Matthews and curveball and uh, be on the sidelines cheering next year. I like it. Well, you're doing great things pushing uh, the game for grassroots baseball as well. Everybody can go follow that on social media, and we look forward to Josh's tenure. Jeff Idelson, president of the Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum, as we get set for the induction of uh, just a great, great class. Jeff, again, thank you a million uh, times over again. You've always been so nice with your time. I will see you on Wednesday. All right. Looking forward to it, Michael. The ML Sports Platter is brought to you by our great friends, at Rosie's Corner, pizza, pasta, hot and cold subs, and more. And be on the lookout when October hits. Rosie's is going back to that cold weather menu. Yeah, I know, the cold weather. We don't like it, but we love the food at Rosie's. We hunker down and eat the meatloaf Monday, the turkey slop Tuesday, chicken and biscuit Wednesday, and, of course, the mac and cheese will be available, uh, as it always is, Thursdays and Fridays, and, of course, fish Friday as well. Rosie's Corner right in front of the Brewerton Bridge in Brewerton. If you're in and around central New York, Get on over to Rosie's Corner. Tip of the cap, thank you as well to our great friends over at the Syracuse Fitness Store, Prestwick Golf, and your State Farm agent, Matt Graham. Go get a free rate quote today from Matt at SyracuseInsuranceAgent.com, SyracuseInsuranceAgent.com. Just a couple of quick minutes here um, from my seat and, and Derek Jeter and his career and 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 what you know he's kind of meant to me. And, and I mentioned this to Jeff just a minute ago. I mean, it really is true. You know, when you're 41, almost going to be 42, you didn't live through Ruth, Garrick, Barra, DiMaggio, Mantle. You hear the stories. I hear the stories from my dad. I heard them from my grandmother. I heard them from, um, you know, several old-timers. I've interviewed a bunch of players from that from that era. I've interviewed Cleet Boyer and Whitey Ford and Bobby Richardson uh, countless times. And, you know, I, I, I just look at Jeter, and as time passes, 
quickly, by the way. That 90s dynasty, four World Series wins in five years. And, you know, even though they stopped winning for quite a while as far as winning at all, you know, they were still in the World Series in 2001. They were still in it in 2003. They still, um, you know, had 100 win seasons. They were still successful. They were still at the top. They were still on the cover of magazines. They were still in the mix. They were still picked to win it all most years as well. And then finally they get back over the hump in 09 for the fifth ring for Jeter and, and company. But, you know, during a lot of those years, people forget, like, Derek Jeter should have won an MVP in 2006. You know, Justin Morneau won it. Jeter carried him that year, and he really carried him to a certain extent, despite having Hideki Matsui, A-Rod, Johnny Damon. He carried him for several weeks at a time in 2009 in the championship season as well. But it's just moment after moment after moment. You know, six all-time in hits. Just, he was he was the guy on the stage, man. The bright lights hit, and he was the guy you knew you were going to pay pay to see play, and he was going to come through. He was going to come through with the best Broadway performance of all time. Uh, you know, the Game 4 home run in the 2000 World Series against Bobby Jones. The Mets had just taken Game 3. Um, the momentum swung back their way. First pitch, goodbye, center field, Jeter, momentum back to the Yankees. They win Game 4, they win Game 5, and, and that's that, right? Like, Jeter wins the All-Star MVP before that in the same season. Still the only player in the history of the game to win All-Star MVP and uh, World Series MVP. And then all the moments. I mean, think about who goes 5-for-5 five five and gets a home run for their 3,000th hit off of one of the best pitchers at that time in the game in David Price. Who does that? Derek Jeter does that. Five rings, Derek Jeter does that. 14-time All-Star, Derek Jeter does that. Rookie of the Year wins a World Series in his first year. Derek Jeter does that, right? Number two, retired. Monument Park, Roberto Clemente Award, two-time Hank Aaron Award, five silver sluggers, right? Like we're, like I mentioned, the two MVPs in the in, in the All-Star game and in the World Series in the same year. I mean, who does that kind of stuff? And by the way, 0.25% not voting him in as an 100% guy, he deserved to be 100%. Just like Mo, just like a ton of guys before, both of those guys should have been 100%. How do you say no to Ted Williams, Babe Ruth, Joe, Joe DiMaggio, Stan Musial, and Willie Mays and Frank Robinson and Mantle, right? Like the, the list goes on and on and on. But he, he was a guy you could count on, really. And in the postseason, and I'll, and I'll wrap on this, in the postseason, Derek Jeter hit 308. And I love the anti-Yankee people and the, 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 the under, you know, oh, he's so overrated and da-da-da. Derek Jeter was only two point you know, two points below for his postseason average than his regular season mark. He was a 308 lifetime hitter in in in, in October, and he was a 310 lifetime hitter uh, in, in the regular season. The competition's better. There's more rounds. The pressure is on you more. And oh, by the way, the pitching is far superior in you know five and, and seven game series than, than than ever before in, in the regular season. So. To me, you know, for Jeter to actually keep his regular season numbers as high when you're feasting on more, you know, fourth rotation guys, fifth rotation guys, weaker bullpen guys, you know, 19 games against the Orioles, 19 games, you know, against the Blue Jays during a time where really it was only kind of like Roy Halladay and they had a really bad bullpen and the rest of the rotation was kind of shaky. They had a great offense, but you could feast on those type of teams, right? You played against the Royals, you played against bad bullpens and the Rangers and the Angels, etc. Bad, bad rotations. And you know, in the postseason, it's different. You're facing Smoltz, you're facing Maddox, you're facing, you know, remember the Mulder, Zito, uh, Tim Hudson, Oakland A's staff, right? You're facing, uh, you know, Mike Messina. You know, you're facing those type of guys. You know, you're facing big time, big time pitchers, and so. Uh, I, I, it's just a wicked tip of the cap to him. And the moments are just, it's endless. I mean, the flip, Mr. November, the dive in the stands in 2004 against the Red Sox, which technically I wish didn't happen because that created Theo Epstein to basically trade everybody and get the clowns out and, and make the move, you know, Nomar Garcia Parra out, bring in Doug Mankiewicz. And then uh, it, it created that culture for the Red Sox that eventually allowed them to come back and beat the Yankees in the ALCS four games uh, in a row. But you know, Derek Jeter's my DiMaggio. He's my Mantle. He's my Mays. He's my Aaron. He's my Ruth. He's my Garrick. He's my Frank Robinson. He's my any of those guys. Ted Williams, because he was, for my time, he was the face of the game. He wasn't even the best player for the duration of his career while he was the face of the game. I think he was the best player, you know, a couple, two, three years here and there during his career. But for me, he's my Mantle. He's my DiMaggio. Uh, 
just an unbelievable career. I'm so thankful, so grateful to be in Cooperstown today uh, to be able to, you know, celebrate this and cover this. And, and, you know, he's my favorite player of all time. And when the corona hit and they canceled it, I just didn't know if they were going to have this. And Jeff and Jane Forbes Clark and everybody getting this thing done is super awesome. Congratulations to the entire class. Marvin Miller, of course, and his family, Ted Simmons uh, and Larry Walker. And, of course, Derek Sanderson Jeter, the terrific New York Yankee for 20 years, a classic Yankee, a five-time World Series champ, and sixth all-time in hits. All right, to wrap this thing up, last week Derek Jeter joined a bunch of folks on a Zoom call to talk about his induction into the Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. Here is that audio. Um, So it looks like we are ready to begin, and we will start with Tyler Kepner. Tyler, you can unmute yourself now. All right, hey Derek, how you doing? Tyler, I'm doing all right. How about yourself? I'm good. Um, I wanted to ask you about the position of shortstop. Um, it was the only position you ever played. Um, why did you love it so much? What did you love about that position? Um, well, first, I fell in love with the position because my dad was a shortstop. So my dad played shortstop at Fisk University in Tennessee, which I'm, I'm sure you probably heard me say before, Tyler. But, but he was... Uh, you know, because he played shortstop, that's the position I wanted to play. And, and you know, I was when I was younger. Actually, matter of fact, kind of funny because my dad coached me a couple of years in the little league, so he had me play second base and third base as well. So that's probably the only other time I didn't play shortstop was when I was playing for my dad. But uh, I just wanted to be like him when I was younger. Did you ever entertain the idea of <clears throat> of going to another position? And, and how did that become kind of part of your identity as a ball player? I never, I you know. Well, look, let me say one thing. It, it's not easy just to switch positions. I mean, that's that's difficult. When I was younger, I, I pitched a little bit, but you know, I wanted to be an everyday player. I like to play every day. Um, so, no, I never entertained uh, playing another position. I remember being very young and, and telling my dad I thought it was easy to play outfield. I mean, he put me in the outfield, hit me some fly balls, and I wasn't very good. So that was the end of the outfield experiment. Yeah. And lastly for me, um, what – what did people maybe misunderstand or not get right about your defense? Uh, you know, the metrics obviously said one thing, but you won all the time and you won gold gloves, so it must have worked out. What, what did what were any misconceptions about you on, on D? Uh, I don't know. You know, I mean, yeah, look, I get an analytics has, has entered the game a little bit more um, towards the end of my career. And, and look, I, I think as you get older, like I, I – played my first game in New York when I was 20. I played my last when I was 40. Um, you probably slow down a little bit towards the end of your career. I think that's what's supposed to happen. And uh, so I, I, you know, I prided myself on, on being consistent. And um, yeah, I mean, it, is it fair to say probably my last year wasn't as good as my, you know, the middle of my career? I'm sure it's fair to say that. But um, my job was to be consistent and uh, day in and day out uh, be accountable. So yeah, I don't. I don't really pay much attention to it now. I'm not playing anymore, so I don't think it really makes a difference. Thanks, man. See you next week. All righty. Thank you. All right. Our, our next question will go to Anthony McCarron. Anthony, you can unmute yourself. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, hi, Derek. Uh, congratulations again. Um, Thank you. I'd like to ask you about the flip play. Uh, it's always going to be associated with you and your your career. Uh, as as a highlight, Um, all these years later, what do you make of that play and how it transpired, and and what do you make of all the attention that it has gotten uh, over all these years? Yeah, uh, Anthony, I'll tell you, it's probably the the one play I get asked about the most. It's it's the one play I see the most. Um, And look, I I, I was where I was supposed to be. I mean, I tell people that all the time. You know, it's interesting because after – uh, the election, we, we went to uh, MLB Studios, and, and Harold Reynolds actually was doing an interview, and he showed me actually in that same place, the same area of the field, on another play a few years later. So that's something that we worked on in spring training. I know you were down in spring training. Maybe you saw us do it, but that's where I was supposed to be. I mean, uh, you know, actually flipping it to home is not part of part of the job, but, uh, you know, I sort of improvised there at the end. But I was in the area I was supposed to be in, and, um, you know, fortunately, everything worked out for us. And, you know, I've been asked about, the, you know, Jeremy Giambi, if he would have slid, would he have been safe? Probably, but he didn't. So that's why I think that the play stands out. But I was in the area I was supposed to be. 
You're on mute, Anthony. Hi. Uh, sorry. One. One follow up. Are, are you okay with with the idea that that this is like you know the Derek Jeter signature play, or or would you pick another one? And if so, what would it be? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm fine fine with it. I mean, it's it's uh, it's. I don't know if I've ever looked at one. Say, I can think. Yeah, you know, I think the jump throw people mention quite a bit. Um, but look, that was a postseason game. And, uh, you know, we're on the brink of elimination. So I think just the fact that we're in the playoffs, and, you know, I think that that made the importance of the play um, stand out a little bit more. So, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. Thank you. Yep. Uh, next up, we're going to go to Mark Feinstein. Mark, go right ahead. Hey, Derek. How you doing? Congratulations. Thanks, Mark. Um, First question I have for you is, it's been a long time since the election actually happened. How much have you been looking forward to, to this week finally getting here and actually going up there and, and being inducted? I don't want to jinx anything, Mark. I mean, <laughs> you know, I've both phones, so I'm hoping that it happens next week. Uh, you know, it, it's there were so many things going on in the world that, uh, you know, for the first year or so, I, I really didn't think about it much. You know, early on... Um, I was, I was getting excited for it, and then it was canceled, and then your mind goes in other places. Um, so I am looking forward to getting up there, you know, next week, hopefully, and knocking on wood. Um, but, yeah, it's been a long time coming. I know you're a guy who's always said you don't look ahead, you, you just look at the present, but I'm sure you've been thinking about this day. Have you thought about what it's going to be like? Have you thought about what you're going to feel like up there and just sort of, you know, this is not a situation where somebody's throwing a ball and you have to anticipate a pitch, but you have some control over what this day is going to be like for you. Have you thought about what this day is going to be like? And, and do you think it's a matter of, uh, you know, meeting expectations? You know, as, as strange as this sounds or may sound, I'm trying not to think about it because I just want to go there and experience it and experience for the first time. You know, I went to Mariano's induction a couple of years ago. Uh, that's the first time I've been to Cooperstown in years. You know, I went when I was very young. First time I've been there in years. And um, so I, I'm looking forward to getting up there and going to the museum and, and, and meeting with all the Hall of Famers and spending some time with them. And then, you know, obviously the ceremony and the speech. And, you know, those are things that, uh, you know, I'm trying to keep out of my mind because I do want to I want to go in there with no preconceived notions of what may happen. And, and I want to experience it and try to enjoy it. And just the last question I had, you're obviously being inducted for your, your play on the field and what you did on the field, but the captaincy was such a, a part of your persona and your identity for the last you know bunch of your decade or so of your career. What did it mean to you to have that title? And did you did you try to take a particular leadership style in that in that role? You know, it meant a lot because I know it's a title that's not thrown around too lightly in our organization. And prior to the boss naming me the captain, there were whispers that it may happen. And, you know, one thing, when he called me and he, and he told me, uh, or he asked me, actually, if, if I was okay with being named captain, the one thing he told me, he said, listen, I don't want you to change anything. I want you to continue to do and handle yourself how you've handled yourself up until this point. That's why I'm naming you the captain. So, you know, I, I think as you get a little bit older and, and you're around a little bit longer, you may be a little bit more vocal behind the scenes. I mean, Mark, you cover us for a long time. I mean... You know, I, I wasn't a guy that, that spoke just for the sake of speaking. I spoke when I had something to say, and I did a lot of it behind the scenes. I did a lot of it where other people didn't know. So um, the responsibility of being the captain is, is a big one with our organization. And, uh, you know, as a title, I didn't take lightly. Thanks, Derek. Enjoy next week. Thank you. <clears throat> next up, we'll have David Ben. David, go right ahead. Hey, Derek. Congratulations. Thank um you. Derek, given the global nature of baseball um, <clears throat> and the popularity of the Yankees, uh, your personal popularity is, is, is certainly global. And I wanted to ask you, uh, are you aware of your personal following, specifically in Latin America? Uh, even a couple weeks ago, Miguel Rojas said that he was so honored to be playing shortstop for the team of his idol on the Marlins. And so I wanted to know how aware you were of your personal following in Latin America, and if so, what that meant to you. 
I, you know, I'm aware of it, um, David, because I've spent a lot of time in Latin America. You know, I've had teammates, you know, from all over the world, and I've been to Venezuela, I've been to Dominican, I've been to Panama, I've been to Cuba, I've been to these places in Latin America, and there's there's a big, um, you know, Yankee following in all of those countries. And and look, you, you mentioned uh, Miggy. You know, I, I'm a little bit older than Miggy is, and and you know, a lot of times, you, you especially now. Uh, you meet players who are currently playing, and, and they say they grew up watching you, right? And, and whether you were a, a Yankee fan or not, most people watched the postseason, and, and we were in the postseason year in and year out. So, uh, you know, I do understand the fact that the, the Yankees, the brand of the Yankees is global. But uh, in terms of Latin America, I, I was aware of it. I am aware of it because just of the, the time that I've spent in those countries. Thanks, Eric. Yep. And next up will be Tara Sullivan. Tara, go right ahead. Hey, Derek, how are you? Congratulations. Tara, what's up? How are you? Thank you. I'm, I'm good, thank you. Um, I, just, I was going to follow a little bit of what Tyler and Anthony were asking about your defense, which I actually find interesting because I was wondering if it seems odd or different to you at all that many of your signature plays or moments are on defense, and yet you kind of get asked about it a lot. Do you have a favorite one? or was it flip or whatever. I know I'm putting you kind of on the spot. But does it seem strange that defense really does come up as much as it does with you? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I, look, um, like I said, I, I only played one position. I played it for 20 years. Um, analytics sort of came into the game towards the end of my career. Uh, so I think a lot of the defensive whispers started towards the end of my career. And look, you know, looking back, it's understandable. I mean, it's understandable as you get towards the end of your career, but um, you know, I prided myself on being consistent. And and you know, when when you, a play needed to be made, I felt as though I was going to make it. And and uh, you know, I, I argue that my teammates um, had confidence in me making the plays as well. So I don't really pay much attention to it, right? Because I, I don't think it's it's possible to have that much success as a team if you had someone that was just so poor defensively. So if you get asked about the, the the flip the most, where does the jumping into the stands and coming up bloody land? Uh, I think it's a little bit further down the line. You know, I think they, it's, it's the flip play. I think it's the jump throw. Um, I think it's some of the relays. Um, but, yeah, they do mention that because of our opponent. Where, you know, we're playing Boston at the time. So, so that does get brought up quite a bit as well. Thank you. Next up is John Kikis. John, go right ahead. Hey, Derek. Congratulations. Uh, are, are you aware that uh, your name is mentioned by by executives and players as an influence in how, how to play the game? And what does that mean to you? Uh, I've heard it somewhat. I mean, I'm not I'm not a privy to all the information that other. You know, organizations are saying, but I, look, I, I tried to play the game the right way. I tried to play it hard. You know, I tried to play hard every single day, and, and I felt as though that was my responsibility. And uh, anytime you have someone that mentions uh, your name with, with playing the game the right way, it makes you feel good. It's humbling uh, because, you know, a lot of organizations, you know, I've doing my best to try to beat them throughout the years. And then for them to have respect for how you played the game, it makes you feel really good. And one other question that do you like the new rules in baseball, and do you think that the game needs to be speeded up? I'm sorry, what was that the first do you, part? Do you like the new rules in baseball, and do you feel like the game still needs to be speeded up? I don't even necessarily know if, if, if the game needs to be sped up. I just think there needs to be a little bit more action in the game. I think when, when uh, fans come to the games, they want to see things happen. And then unfortunately, at this point in time, there's a lot of time during the game where there's not a lot of action. So I'd like to see more action. Uh, I think there's some of the rules that I do like. You know, I, as a matter of fact, I like the runner on second base in extra innings. I do. So it's, uh, yeah, I think every every sport, every, every you know, every sport changes and evolves over time. And I think baseball's at the point where they're, they're making some adjustments to it as well. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Next up will be Bruce Levine. Bruce, go right ahead. Eric, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, all the wonderful things that you gave to baseball. And also, um, it was a, a real pleasure watching you play. 
uh, all the time. Thank you for that. Um, I wonder uh, where the next Derek Jeter's will come from in baseball, and if uh, you being uh, you know major influence as an owner right now can identify a winning player for people to go out and scout and sign and develop uh, in this era of uh, you know the home run player. Um. But I think, you know, look, I, I think I think what people need to understand is, is there's there's the most important thing when you're playing is to win. And, and I've said this before. I don't know if you've heard me say it before. Probably not. But I think one of the things what, that, that uh, is an issue for, you know, some players nowadays is, you know, you go to all these showcases, right, and it's all about how hard you throw, how fast you run, how far you can hit it. And then when you get players, you need to teach them how to win. You know, winning is something that you have to learn to do. It doesn't come easy. You know, there's a way to do it. There's a way to play the game, and there's a way to be unselfish. So I think, you know, one thing we try to do in, in our organization, we try to teach everyone how to win. And that's a process. It takes a little bit of time. But um, I think people need to understand that the ultimate goal is for you to win. Great. We have time for uh, two or three more questions, and we'll go now to Craig Mish. Craig? Thank you, Derek. Congratulations. Thanks, Craig. Uh, Derek, I know that I believe you had mentioned that while you were going through it and winning the World Series that you did, all those with the Yankees, that it was kind of hard to appreciate it because you were always looking to get to the next year and win the next one. And, and I'm wondering... You know, in terms of challenges, because now you have the challenge, you know, going on with Miami, obviously, as as, uh, as owner and CEO. Where where did that come from with you? Where, where where when did that start happening for you? Where you always, you know, wanted to be challenged. Um, you know, similarly, I would think to you know Michael Jordan kind of goes through that too, always with the challenge. The great players have had that. Where did that come from with you? Uh, I think it's a, it's an eight. I think it's something that I I always you know. You always have to, you know, you talk about competition, right? You, 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 competition eliminates complacency, and, and you pay attention to your competition. But I think at the same time, you know, you're competing with yourself and, and never being satisfied. And, and, and I've always said I, I never wanted my career to be over. And then for me to say, well, I wish I would have done a little bit more. And, and ultimately, you're judged, especially in New York, you're judged by winning you know, that's what makes Old Timers Day so important and so special is because, you know, guys come back and there's memories and they remember you if you win. And, uh, you know, it was funny because I always had Yogi Berra used to come in the locker room and, and uh, you know, he every time we'd won, he'd come over and remind me of how many rings he had. And, uh, you know, I used to joke with him and say, well, you know, it's a little bit harder now because there's the more rounds of the playoffs. You went straight to the World Series. And, and his response was, you can come over to my house and count the rings anytime you want. So I always felt as though you're, you're, you're trying to chase something, and and I think that's the only way you have to you can be. Is that's the only way you're going to improve? Is you always got to try to get better. And for me, getting better meant winning more. And, and, and as a follow up to that, as your career, you look back on it, and certainly you accomplished everything possible as as a major leaguer. And here we are on the, on the on the doorstep of you being inducted into the Hall of Fame. Was that part of taking the challenge as being the CEO of the Marlins too? Was just you know something else to you know challenge yourself at at that moment? Yeah, I like to compete. You know, I like to compete. I became vocal probably the last you know ten or so years of my career is that. You know what I wanted to do next, and I wanted to be a part of an ownership group, and I wanted to be have an opportunity to build something that was special. And and uh, the, you know the teams don't come up for sale that often, and and uh, you know we were fortunate to get the opportunity here. So um, look, if, you know, people say it's a challenge, but I look at it as an opportunity, and and we're still competing, just just not on the field. Uh, me personally, not on the field, but you're still competing on the field. Thank you. Congrats. Thank you. <clears throat> Next up, we have uh, Bill Francis. Bill, go right ahead. Uh, congratulations, Derek. Thank you, Bill. Um, you mentioned your induction speech earlier. I'm guessing this is going to be one of the most important speeches of your life so far. Can you talk about the process of writing <laughs> the speech? <laughs> yeah, I'm still going through the process right now. Um, so I have not finished. You know, John is probably... Uh, 
upset with me now because they told me I had to get it in like a month before. But uh, it's something that I've tried to take my time with, um, write down notes. I didn't want to get help from anyone. I didn't want anyone to see it uh, or see it before I, I deliver it. Um, but I've had I've, I've had some speeches that I had to address the crowd before. You know, we closed Yankee Stadium. So in terms of addressing the crowd, I've done that before, but this is a little bit longer. I mean, you're talking about a speech that's 10, 15 minutes. So um, it's kind of hard to uh, to uh, cover your entire career in that short period of time. But uh, I'm still working on it. And you mentioned you had been to Cooperstown as a youth. Any memories of how old you were and how that, that experience back then? I don't. You know, I don't. I was very young. I remember going there, but I don't remember any of the details. Okay. So that's why I'm looking forward to actually going through the um, museum when, when I get up there. Thanks, Derek. Yep. And last question will go to David Edelstein. David, go right ahead. Derek, congratulations. Thank you. I know that we uh, missed you. I, I'm the local media television station in Cooperstown, so I know that we had that on the calendar back in last February, and uh, the world kind of fell apart right before you made it up here. So looking forward to seeing you here next week, and hopefully uh, you get a chance to that. Um, I get a lot of opportunities to talk with the Hall of Fame staff in this area about um, what the Hall of Fame is really about. It's not just a museum. It's not just a black gallery. Uh, they talk a lot about how it's about the legacy that the players leave, not only during their playing career, but then transition at this moment at, at their induction into kind of a new legacy and a new role. You specifically have multiple roles as a player. You were a captain. You're an owner of a team now. I'm wondering what you want your legacy to be or your role in baseball to be going forward now as a Hall of Famer um, with this global and, and world recognition that you have. Yeah, that's a, well, that's a good question. I don't know if I can answer it in a short period of time. Um, you know, my the most important thing during my career, the most important thing, people say what I wanted to be remembered as, I wanted to be remembered as a Yankee. As a Yankee, that was it. That was the only thing. I, the only team I ever wanted to play for, um, since I as far back as I could remember. So that's what I wanted my legacy to be. Um, as you start playing your career, you start thinking about legacy, and it's, it's much more than what you do on the field. It's, it's the legacy you leave off the field, and whether that, that's work with my foundation, through my foundation in New York, Michigan, and Florida. Um, it's what I'm doing down here in Miami. I, you know, baseball's been a big part of my life, and uh, it will continue to be. So I think uh, when you talk about legacy post-playing career, I think I'm still working on it. But during my career, it was, it was just to be a Yankee. Awesome. And I think David maybe had another one. I've kind of lost him. Uh Tiny, are you able to... There we go. All right, yes, we don't have permission to unmute ourselves. 2021 problem. Um, Derek, I just wanted to ask also, um, with the 20th anniversary of 9-11 coming up, um, you played in the city, at, obviously, those 20 years ago, and it, it had, I mean, I don't need to describe it for you, but what kind of impact baseball has had in bringing the community together and just everything. Uh, so another question that might be huge, but um, what, what is going through your mind now yeah, I mean, you mentioned that sports has a, has a great way of bringing communities together. Uh, you know, I, I just remember back then it was it was uh, it was almost an uncomfortable feeling, I think, for for all of us um, when we first got back to playing baseball because you know the first thing you think about is does this really matter? I mean, we're playing a sport, and then yeah, we had the chance to meet a lot of the families and and, and firefighters and. EMS workers and, and you know the thing that, that we figured out was even if it was for a short period of time three hours a day we gave some some people uh, something to cheer for so we felt as though we were playing for more than just ourselves we felt as though we were playing for all of New York and and um, you know a lot of stories that that uh, a lot of people we had an opportunity to meet and get to know a lot of smiles we put on people's faces and you um, that was probably as loud of a World Series or three games, I should say, in New York um, as I've heard. And, and unfortunately, we didn't win. But, um, you know, it just goes to show you that uh, sports plays a big role, in my mind, in the healing process for a lot of communities at, at certain points. And, and we gave uh, New Yorkers, I think, something to cheer for 
even if, like I said before, if it was for three hours a day. And there you have it, celebrating Derek Jeter as he goes into the Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum today in Cooperstown, New York. I'm Mike Lindsley. This is the ML Sports Platter, all brought to you by Stanley Law Offices and Bryant and Stratton College of Syracuse. A big tip of the cap thank you as well to the Swan and Whitaker families for their support of the platform, as well as the Vince Aguirre Consulting Group and Welch & Company Jewelers. As I always tell you, enjoy the games. Hey.